Chemical reactions generally fall into one of five different types of reactions. The first type of reaction is called a synthesis reaction. A synthesis reaction is when two or more elements or compounds combine together to form a more complicated one. The general form of the reaction is A plus B yields AB. Now the letters A and B may be single elements or they might be simple compounds. But the product of the reaction AB combined is a more complicated form of the elements that started the reaction. If you had hydrogen molecules and oxygen molecules contained in the balloon, you would have a mixture of those two gases. But when hydrogen and oxygen are ignited, they get converted into water vapor, which is H2O. So the hydrogen and the oxygen are the simple elements on the left side of the reaction, and the water vapor is the more complicated product on the right side. This is an example of two nonmetals combining to form a binary molecular compound. Another example of a synthesis reaction is the formation of sodium chloride. Here in this series of pictures, on the far left-hand side is a small dish containing sodium metal. The next picture over to the right is a flask containing chlorine gas, which has a slight greenish or yellow hue to it. When I take the sodium metal and the chlorine gas and I combine them together in the same flask, there's a violent reaction that releases heat and light, and the end result of that is a white crystalline solid that we call sodium chloride. This is an example of a synthesis reaction in which a metal and a nonmetal combine together to make a binary ionic compound. In a decomposition reaction, a complex compound breaks down into simpler parts. The general form of the reaction is XY yields X plus Y. Notice we are starting with one reactant and breaking it down into smaller pieces, which is the exact opposite of a synthesis reaction in which we started with smaller pieces and we combined them together to make one complex compound. Normally decomposition reactions are done using heat. So for example, if I take a test tube filled with mercury oxide and I hold it over a Bunsen burner, that mercury oxide will decompose into liquid mercury with oxygen gas being given off through the mouth of the test tube. Decomposition reactions can also be done with a process called electrolysis. Electrolysis involves running an electrical current through a liquid form of that compound. So if I take an electrical current and I run it through water, the water will decompose into its elements, hydrogen and oxygen. In the photograph to the right, I have a normal 9-volt battery immersed in a container of water. On top of that 9-volt battery, I have two test tubes that are upside down. Now those test tubes are originally filled with water and placed over each of the terminals of the battery. When the power is turned on, the electrical current causes the water to decompose into hydrogen and oxygen. The hydrogen gas is being collected in the tube that's on the right-hand side, and the oxygen gas is being collected in the tube that's on the left-hand side. Notice that there seems to be about twice as much hydrogen gas as there is oxygen gas, which matches the balanced chemical equation. There are some compounds that are naturally unstable and will break down without the use of heat and electricity. These unstable compounds will need to be memorized because they can be products of other reactions, but since they're unstable, they'll decompose and break down. Ammonium hydroxide will break down into water and ammonia gas. Ammonium hydroxide is the substance that is in Windex, and because it's naturally unstable, it breaks down and gives off the ammonia vapors that give Windex its characteristic smell. Carbonic acid is also unstable and will break down into water and carbon dioxide. So anytime carbonic acid is formed, it will spontaneously break down to release carbon dioxide gas. Sulfurous acid is also unstable and will break down into water and sulfur dioxide. Finally, hydrogen peroxide is naturally unstable and will break down into water and oxygen gas. Notice that each of these four compounds will break down into water and a characteristic gas depending on the elements that were present in the original compound. A single displacement reaction is one in which one element trades places with another element in a compound. The general form of a single displacement reaction is A plus BX 
yields AX plus B. Notice that the single element on the left-hand side has displaced the element that is part of the compound, so that before the reaction, the element A is all by itself, whereas after the reaction, the element B is all by itself. There are some general patterns for determining single displacement reactions. The first is that reactive metals will replace lesser active metals. So in this particular reaction, I take a copper wire and I place it down into a solution of silver nitrate. Now copper and silver are both relatively unreactive metals, but copper is still more reactive than silver. So because copper is more reactive, it is more likely to be in a compound than the silver will be. So the copper displaces the silver so that after the reaction, I have copper nitrate and silver. And you can see in the picture, the copper wire at the top is the normal reddish color that copper would be. But the copper that's immersed in the silver nitrate is being covered with this whitish crystal. That whitish crystal is silver. Also notice that the liquid at the bottom of the picture is clear, which is the typical color of silver nitrate. But towards the surface of the solution, that liquid is turning more to a blue color, which is the characteristic color of copper nitrate. Reactive metals will also replace hydrogen, especially hydrogen that's in water or hydrogen that is in an acid. Magnesium is an example of a reactive metal that when placed into hydrochloric acid will cause the hydrogen to be displaced. In this picture, I have a curly piece of magnesium ribbon that has been dropped down into a test tube containing hydrochloric acid. Since the magnesium is more reactive than the hydrogen, the hydrogen is displaced from the compound so that hydrogen bubbles are seen rising to the surface of the test tube. A fourth type of pattern is called a double displacement reaction. In a double displacement reaction, two elements or ions switch places, forming two new compounds. The general form is AB plus XY yields AY plus BX. The general pattern is that the ions that are towards the outsides of each reactant combine together to form a new product, and the ions that are towards the insides of each reactant combine together to form a different product. An example of this is when sodium iodide and lead nitrate are mixed together. Now sodium iodide and lead nitrate are both colorless, but when I take these two colorless solutions and I mix them together, a bright yellow precipitate of lead iodide forms and a clear solution of sodium nitrate left over. Notice the pattern that the ions rearrange. The sodium and the nitrate were on the outsides of the reactants and they combined together to form a product. And the lead and the iodine were towards the insides of the reactants and they combined together to make a different compound. Another example is when you take acetic acid and mix it together with sodium bicarbonate. This is the common kitchen reaction of taking vinegar and mixing it with baking soda. So when you take these two reactants and mix them together, the outsides of each compound form carbonic acid, but the insides of each compound form sodium acetate. Now both sodium acetate and carbonic acid are soluble in water, so you would expect to see nothing happen, but the solution bubbles vigorously. And the reason why you see so many bubbles is remember that carbonic acid is one of those unstable compounds that spontaneously decomposes. And when carbonic acid decomposes, it changes into water and carbon dioxide. So the final result of the reaction is I get a salt water solution made of sodium acetate, water, and carbon dioxide bubbles, which you can see escaping from the surface of the liquid. Now all double displacement reactions must result in the formation of a solid, a liquid, or a gas. Otherwise, there's no visible reaction that occurs. The last type of reaction is called a combustion reaction. In a combustion reaction, a substance combines with oxygen and releases a large amount of energy during the reaction. Oxygen gas is required for any combustion reaction, and without the oxygen gas, the reaction does not occur. A simple version of a combustion reaction is the burning of magnesium. When I light magnesium ribbon on fire, what allows the flame to continue burning is the presence of oxygen in the air. The combustion of magnesium produces a bright white light and a lot of heat and results in the formation of a whitish powder called magnesium oxide. A more familiar combustion reaction would be that of butane. So butane is the liquid that is present in lighters. 
And when that butane reacts with oxygen, it will result in carbon dioxide and water vapor being released. But that reaction also releases a significant amount of heat and light that is used for lighting candles or lighting your barbecue grill. Now you can actually calculate the amount of energy that can be absorbed or released by a reaction by analyzing the chemical bonds that are broken and formed in the reaction. Let's use a combustion reaction in our example. In this reaction, I'm taking methane, which is the gas that are in our burners in the laboratory, and I'm burning it to produce carbon dioxide and water, as well as heat energy. Now remember from several chapters ago that when I have two atoms, they are unstable and have a lot of potential energy. As those atoms get closer together, they become more and more stable, and they release energy when they form chemical bonds. This is represented by the red lines on the right side of this diagram, where I'm forming two carbon-oxygen bonds in the carbon dioxide, and where I'm forming four oxygen-hydrogen bonds in the water. So if forming bonds releases energy, breaking bonds will require energy. Elements are more stable when they're in compounds, and so if I'm going to break those elements apart to form individual atoms, I'm making them more unstable. Because I have to force them to become more unstable, I have to add energy. That input of energy is represented by the blue lines on the left-hand side. Notice that I increase my potential energy when I break the four carbon-hydrogen bonds in the methane, and when I break the two oxygen bonds in the oxygen molecule. So to kind of summarize this diagram, as I break the bonds of the methane, and I break the bonds of the oxygen, my atoms become more and more unstable, and they have a lot of potential energy. But then those atoms rearrange to form carbon dioxide, which releases a little bit of energy, and form water, which releases even more energy. The amount of energy that I needed to break the chemical bonds is not as much as the amount of energy that was released when the carbon dioxide and the water was formed. And so overall, that gives a net energy change that has a negative value. This negative energy change tells me that the reaction is exothermic, which means that it gives off heat energy. There are several reactions that would result in a positive energy change, and those reactions would be endothermic, meaning that they absorb heat energy. Finally, we can use our understanding of these reaction patterns to predict the products of chemical reactions. If I have iron metal and I burn that iron metal in the presence of oxygen gas, because I have two single elements, those single elements are likely to combine together to make a more complex one called iron oxide. That is called a synthesis reaction. The opposite of synthesis is decomposition. You can recognize a decomposition reaction easily because it normally starts with only one compound on the reactant side. So for example, silver oxide is heated, and that silver oxide will break down into silver metal and oxygen gas. The next one is an example of a combustion reaction, where I have a hydrocarbon being burned in the presence of oxygen. Anytime you burn a hydrocarbon, regardless of how many carbons and how many hydrogens are present, will always result in the formation of carbon dioxide and water. Now for simplicity's sake, none of these reactions are balanced because I want you to simply focus on what products are being formed. In the next reaction, I have copper combining with sodium nitrate. Now here I have one element and one compound. This is typical of a single displacement reaction. In order to determine whether this reaction will occur, I need to look at an activity series. An activity series ranks all of the metals from most active to least active. So to figure out the products of the copper and the sodium nitrate, I need to find copper and sodium on my activity series. If the single element is close to the top of the activity series, it will kick out or displace the metal that's in the compound. In this situation, copper is actually lower than sodium on my activity series, which means copper is less reactive than sodium, and so no reaction will occur. The metal that is more reactive is already part of the compound, and copper is not reactive enough to cause a displacement. This last reaction is an example of a double displacement reaction. 
I can tell that it's a double displacement reaction because I have two compounds that are reactants on the left-hand side of the arrow. In order to predict my products, I need to look at the ions that are on the outside of each reactant. So in this case, that would be barium sulfate and the ions that are on the inside of the reactants, which in this case is potassium chloride. So my products will be barium sulfate and potassium chloride. I also need to determine whether those new compounds, barium sulfate and potassium chloride, are soluble in water. And to do that, I need a solubility table. So I find where potassium and chloride intersect on this table, and I find that potassium chloride is aqueous. And then I can find where barium and sulfate intersect on this table, and I see that barium sulfate is a solid. So I can go back and add the appropriate symbols to my reaction. So barium chloride and potassium sulfate will combine together to make potassium chloride and barium sulfate. And in this case, the barium sulfate is a white precipitate that will form and sink to the bottom of my test tube.